welcome to season 11 episode 11 of the ubuntu podcast it's thursday the 17th of may we're a bit late sorry about that and this week we're going to be discussing what's been happening in the news and in the community i'm alan hello and joining me this week are the usual rabble mark hello mark how are you doing hello hello and Not martin well, thanks hello um mark have you put your bathroom back together again we heard last have, time that you much. smashed it to bits yes it is, is, it, uh, is it usable it is, again? It is more or less back in order. Good. How was that? Did you do it yourself or did you get man in? <laughs> um, I had assistance from friend and family. Ah. Um, but yes, um, yeah, it's lots of hard work on our part and plumbing isn't as fun as computers, I've discovered. <laughs> <laughs> a never Ma- a truer word. Ma- mainly because when, uh, when you get computers wrong, you don't get water all over the floor. Yeah. Yes. This is true. I, I made a catastrophic plumbing error once in my first house, and I have vowed never to tr- tr- attempt plumbing ever again since. Yeah, I, I, I just don't understand it. I just don't understand all these pipes and what goes down them and how they fit together and <laughs> how, you, how they bend and how you cut I, them. I, and... I now know a lot more than I used to. Right. Are you going like, to use that information? That I used to like, when, when we last spoke to each other. Is it I've learned a lot. Like learning Pythagoras at school, you think you're never going to use that ever again? <laughs> uh, I hope I'll never have to use it ever again. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm currently, there's, there's, one, there's one tiny bit which I'm not sure whether there's a leak or not. So oh, that doesn't sound confident. No, I, I, there was, and then I think we fixed it, but I don't quite trust it because it kept on coming back. Pro tip, so, um, don't ignore a leak. We ignore no, exactly. a leak. I'm, I'm giving it a couple of days to really make sure that it's right. not leaking. And Good. then, yeah, and then I just have to redecorate and it's all fine. Awesome. Good yes. to hear. And then back on the computers. Yep. Excellent. What about you, when people you've been up to? Uh, I've been uh, sorting out my office. I complete reorganise of my office. I know. I've, the I, shelves around. I, when I have meetings with you during the day, I should take uh, like screen grabs every every <laughs> so often because stuff like I, I could do a like a, a time lapse. Time of, lapse. Of your desk being tidied up. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Why so is this I have, What's going on? Well, I, I I'm having to sort out. I've got an, a crazy idea for a project, and I need to, to to move some things around for that. But in so doing, I was reminded just how frustrating and annoying i find all of the cables associated with computers so i've um i've started to go a bit more wireless and i've got a a new wireless mechanical keyboard and a wireless gaming mouse because as, as all the listeners are, are well aware you know i'm i'm elite gamer and i <laughs> i have to have you know the the pinnacle of uh, gaming technology yeah that helps sure my kill rate is um well as it turns out absolutely miserable yeah so so far my 11 year old son has been killing you in the head quite a lot yeah right yeah i i (laughs) i am just cannon fodder for the linux nerds in ballistic overkill i um i suck like you can't immeasurably badly i think my my kill to death ratio was 0.02 last night (laughs) it was pretty miserable so you've got a new project going on is this and you've made some room in 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 the office is this for the pole to go up for your pole dancing gig or is there some or Uh, we're going to hear more about this mentioned the pole dancing i I didn't want to discuss that oh whoops should we move on then let's move on Good Lord, it's time for the news. And boy, what a lot of news there is. Shall we kick it off with something good, Martin? Yeah, well, as we've just established, I'm elite gamer, so I was delighted oh, that again. to see. Yeah, so I was delighted to see this week in the news that the Steam Link app is coming to iOS and Android. What? <clears throat> Steam Link is a hardware device. That's a thing <laughs> you put under the telly. Yeah, yeah, traditionally. So um, what Steam are going to be doing on May the 21st is releasing an Android app and an iOS app for also for Android, um, for Apple TV and Android-based set-top boxes, although it isn't clear which boxes they're going to be compatible with. And this will enable you to use these devices like Steam Link. And even, um, so you, you need a fast network, so either 5G wireless or wired Ethernet, and they're going to be rolling out an update to the Steam controller that will enable Bluetooth so you can pair your Steam controller with your phone or tablet or 
uh, Apple TV device and then play Steam games on on these mobile devices. This is this is amazing in lots of ways. I mean, yes. I as the owner of a Steam Link, I love it, and I love the fact that the kids run upstairs and they turn on the desktop PC and then they come downstairs and we all hand a controller out to everyone and we turn on the Steam Link and we connect to the PC upstairs and we play a load of silly games in the lounge and it's it's nice because we're all like sat together in a comfy room rather than squished around a PC. It's yeah, it's a really well, nice I'm, way to play. I'm but. really excited for this because I've got an NVIDIA Shield uh, downstairs in the front room and I do use, I subscribe to the NVIDIA service which is the same idea. You know, you can play PC games that are hosted in the cloud by NVIDIA Mm -hmm. and they stream to your device. Well, it's not quite the same idea because with Steam Link, you're streaming from your own PC. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. so so cloud-based versus on your own LAN, but Mm -hmm. the the concept is the same. So I'm hoping that the Steam Link app will come to the NVIDIA Shield because what I've really missed is being able to access my library of Steam games yeah. when I'm in the front room. So I'm really hopeful that that's going to come. Is the N- come. NVIDIA Shield not just an Android device? It is, yes. It's um, it's uh, an Android TV device. So, yeah, it should just come to that it if it's going to be in the Play Store. Through, yeah. mm. it's, it's kind of like a curated store, though. That's why I'm like, I wonder if it's going to come. because no, uh, It doesn't just have Google Play. Yeah, not just everything turns up, unfortunately. Right, right. Mm. But yeah, one of the, one of the things I found particularly like a, a nice surprise about this was the fact that the steam <laughs> controller had the hardware to do bluetooth all along and now they're just turning it on yeah well, has it had bluetooth all along or have they got some kind of software defined radio in there oh okay yeah i don't know i'm just like that. guessing <laughs> yeah i don't know i mean i've there's no bluetooth logo on mine so I'm sure surely someone would have noticed it if it had Bluetooth hardware in one of these hardware teardowns. Someone would have said, oh, look, it's got Bluetooth, but it doesn't use Bluetooth. How weird. Why would that be the case? Or maybe it uses a multifunction chip that happens to have Bluetooth and everyone just thought, oh, well, they're reusing a chip that's got Bluetooth, but they're just not using it. Yeah. Bizarre. Yeah, but anyway. this is also great because your Bluetooth device you can now use with th- well, Bluetooth. Sorry, the Steam controller when it gets this update, I imagine you'll be able to use with things like RetroPie as well. Oh, ooh, yeah. oh, that's, that's also good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now the other thing that was wrapped up in this. Well, story, mind you, you already can use it because it's just a USB device. You're True. saying you'll be able to use it with RetroPie without yeah. the USB dongle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, the other thing that I noticed amongst all of this is apparently Steam have some video service that I wasn't really aware of, but yeah. they're going to be making an app for that that's on these mobile devices as well. Video hmm. service? What video yeah, service? I think, you, I think you can buy video content or rent yeah. video oh, content. Yes, yeah. so you Steam. can go to the store yes. and there's like, yes. you know, series of, of, um, of TV shows and films mm. and stuff in there, yes. just like you have on Google Play. Yeah, I've yeah. bought I've bought a a single film. There is one film in my Steam collection. I think I got it from Humble Bundle or something. Right, uh, interesting. Well, you'll soon be able to watch that on an app on your phone or tablet or whatever. And this this will please Sam immensely because he can mm. play games outside of this room. Like he mm. can just sit on his bed or downstairs or anywhere in the house or even God forbid outside. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm just <laughs> going to go and play outside, Dad. I'll be thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And he'll be out yeah. in the street playing Steam games with his mate, playing Fortnite with a kid next door. Brilliant. Mm. One thing that's that's slightly annoyed me about this was my decision to make my Steam box also my um my sort of home theatre PC for streaming Netflix and stuff in the lounge, which means that I can't actually have someone watching stuff on the in the lounge and me streaming it to um my new Android device in another room because you can't stream steam at the same time as doing something else on the box mm, yeah because it takes the screen basically yeah. doesn't it yeah yeah which is a bit a bit of a shame but um it kind of means that if i do if i do come to rebuild my steam box at some point i might change how i have well, things set up and make it a separate box forgiven for not seeing this coming i don't know that anyone saw this coming yeah. really um, it's a genius move it's brilliant uh speaking of genius moves mark <laughs> uh, yeah, also in gaming news, Microsoft have announced a new Xbox controller. Woohoo. <laughs> but it's not like any old Xbox controller. It's an accessible Xbox controller. Um, what they've done is um, they've released a controller which it looks uh, like a bit of an odd thing. It's this this big sort of plate that sits on a desk or wherever, and it's got a massive A and B button and a D-pad. 
but it's actually like a breakout board where you can plug in other switches and input devices, which means that if you've got um, a physical disability, which means that you can't use um, a normal Xbox controller very well, uh, you can just plug in other switches and buttons and stuff and put them wherever you need them. And then you can play games and they just act like whichever port on the device you plug them into. So the A button, the X button, the shoulder buttons, your switch, which you've plugged in, will act like that button in the game. This, I, it's, it's worth applauding this because mm, yeah. the, the fact that they've done this, there's not many companies on the planet that can, that have the money to throw at this kind of endeavor, this kind of project to bring games to people with restricted mobility um, or, you know, missing one or more limbs that makes it difficult for them to use a standard Xbox controller. Mm. Uh, Microsoft have done done this. And I, I, I saw a promo video, although it wasn't really a promo video. It was like a just an introduction to the product. And um, what I found super interesting was just how flexible you could be with yeah. like where you put all these switches. Like one guy was playing Rocket League with a couple of buttons underneath the desk. So for example, if the only limb you could move is you know your right leg, he could use his right leg only with a pedal and moving his leg left and right in order to steer the car in, in Rocket League, which I thought was just like, that's the minimum you need to be able to play Rocket League. And it worked and it was yeah. just fantastic it was and yeah there was really another great. guy who could who could do, use the one of the analog sticks with one of his thumbs but then um the only other part that he had good control over with his chins was his chin so he had a or sorry his jaw so he had a, a switch next to his chin which he was using to do i think it was the gears on the car so he would just like move his chin to hit this switch to change up and down gears while he was using his thumb to control where the car was going and yeah it's I just, love this. It's I mean, brilliant. We've I've seen people make um, accessible games, and there are there are uh, game jams and um, projects to raise awareness of things like single button games, where yeah. you know you you have one button that does everything, whether it's you know hold yeah. the button down in order to select interface things. But this takes it to a whole new level because you yeah. can use every single button on the controller. Absolutely. They're just they're just wired to different switches around your body. It's yeah, and it's amazing. it's one thing to to you know make games specifically to be accessible right. to people with a specific need but this is making the games which everyone else can already play right you don't have to play some to, to crappy one can't. button game you can actually yeah. play rust or yeah. you know world of warcraft or whatever it is all your friends are playing which is yeah. it, it, it's a leveler for for games now, it's brilliant. I, won, I wonder if this degree of flexibility will get utilized by serious gamers in a way that they can arrange their ah. control surfaces in maybe a more efficient manner <laughs> to yeah. give themselves a competitive advantage yeah you reminded me of um when i watch uh these people who are doing um games done quick if yeah, you ever watch running. any of these speed running live streams some of them hold the controller in really quirky ways in yeah. order to you know, make sure that they've got all the fingers on the right buttons and yeah. able to press them super fast it's, it's pretty interesting yeah yeah, because you could imagine having yeah one button under your toe and one button under your thumb, which you have to press like in succession very quickly. Mm. Mm. I mean, as a as a leak gamer, it was the first thing I thought of when I saw <laughs> of the story. Anything to optimize your game. <laughs> yes, uh, I I was just before we started playing uh, doing the podcast, I was playing um, uh, Blistic Overkill with uh, Sam, and uh, he's learnt this phrase: "Get wrecked" every time he kills me. <laughs> It's, it's quite humbling but, to have your. You heard that a lot this evening. Yeah, have your eleven-year-old son say "get wrecked." So this is opening the the gates for everyone else to, yeah, say "get wrecked" to me. Thanks. Um, so final news item: uh, Google had an announcement at their recent conference I/O, which happens every year, and uh, this was something we've kind of seen coming for a while, and that is they've uh, announced Linux apps are coming to Chrome OS. And you might be thinking, well, Chrome OS already does run on Linux. So, you know, Chrome is a Linux app and it's running on Chrome OS. Well, it's more than that. It's being able to run the applications that you are familiar with on your Linux desktop, maybe on your Ubuntu or Debian or Solus or whatever uh, distribution. It's those kind of applications, not just the browser, which kind of, it's a bit of a game changer for Chrome OS because it's mm. it's really turning it from being that browser-based thing that, oh, it only does the web, into a more general-purpose computing device. And at the, at the event, they, they demoed mostly 
developer tools like Visual mm. Studio Code. Okay. So the big story they were telling was I can use my Chromebook. Hey, look, I'm a developer and I use a Chromebook. It's not just for mum and dad who all they do is scroll through Facebook on it and, you know, look at photos mm. and stuff. Yeah. This is for serious computer users as well. So, I, wonder, I wonder if that will actually gain any interest in the developer community. I mean, it's great that you can run Linux applications on certain models of Chromebooks in the not too distant future. But there's some sort of like badge of honor within the developer community to have a nice MacBook, generally speaking. Well, um, and I wonder if this is going to be able to displace that. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure that's right. I, I'm not, I'm not convinced <clears throat> the MacBook is a badge of honor. Partly the MacBook, we've said it before, partly the reason why mm. people, developers have MacBooks is because they make cross platform apps. And the only way okay. you can do that is you have to have a MacBook in order to. Uh, write Xcode uh, applications in Xcode and publish to the Apple and iOS stores. Like you just can't do it from Windows or Linux. So, and yes, they make nice hardware. And they're not. Oh, woe is me! I'm having to use my MacBook. You know, it's not like um, <laughs> a really terrible experience. But that does help. Why there's so many of them about in developers' mm. hands. But sorry, Mark, what were you going to say? Well, I'm just wondering if you know. It's, I mean, the, when this is announced, my first thought is, isn't the whole point of Chrome OS that you're doing everything on the web? Right. But R- this rather is, this than is it option. runs local apps. So, I mean, is this specifically just going to be targeted at developers or is this trying to, is this like giving up on, on that the web web app paradigm as, as Chrome OS's I, thing? I don't think so. Um, in the same way that, you know, someone might argue that using Linux is all about only using free software and open source software. It's just not the case. Like people have diverse choices they want to make with their hardware. And one person might buy a pixel book because it's a pretty laptop and it has a long battery life and a, 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 a lovely screen, right? Mm. Whereas someone else might want one because yes, it has all of those things, but also I can run my developer tools on it. So I yeah. don't have to put up with in inverted commas a horrible <laughs> windows pc that has you know that's that's not particularly attractive and doesn't have the best screen and mm. you know doesn't have the best experience plus they have the automatic update system that chrome os has keep the thing always up to date and if you lose your stuff you can restore it from the cloud or another machine i don't know what mm. happens with your data that's in your um your your linux apps yeah um Interestingly, the way it's implemented is with LexD. They're LexD containers, oh, really? and the applications, mm. what you end up with is basically a Debian base, and they're applications from the apt archive and a special Chrome uh, archive that has additional applications that make it all fit together and work. Um, but, yeah, it's based on Debian. Yeah, I had a Pixel book a couple of years ago, and ultimately I ended up selling it because I found the whole experience just a little bit too constrained and certainly a feature like this would have made that device much more attractive as a longer term prospect yeah i've seen plenty of people on social media saying okay that's it that's that's sold a chromebook to me now i I, I wouldn't have bought one before this feature was enabled but now this feature is there i'm more likely to have that as my next laptop which is interesting might talk Mm. about this a bit more um another time should we move on So now it's time for the community news and event. Uh, And the first up in the community news, Martin, what have we got? Um, We've got a blog uh, written by uh, Dylan McCall, where he's described in some detail how he set up Ubuntu Core, um, which is the IoT focused version of Ubuntu, and Nextcloud and SyncThing as snaps in order to replace his Dropbox um, subscription. Yeah, I thought this was fascinating um, because I've done something similar and I'll maybe mention that another time, but I thought his post was great because it was very Mm. detailed. And there's there's a lot of things to pick out from this, like... Not only it's great that he's got this auto-updating server that he can have. So I think he used an Intel NUC to do it. it. Um, and he's got this auto- automatic updating home server that he doesn't really have to worry about an awful lot once it's once it's installed and, and up and running. But the, the other takeaway is 
there were quite a lot of steps he had to do to get this thing up and running. It wasn't just install yeah. and then apt install this, apt install that, or snap install this and snap install that. There was quite a bit of shenanigans. And I think we, you and I, and the company need to take a look at that and mm -hmm. see the kind of things that people have to do, the hoops people have to jump through to go yeah. from empty machine to home server running a couple of applications. And it's not even like he's got a lot of applications. That's two snaps he's two got snaps. on there. Yeah. And it's quite, but yeah. it's a super interesting post. He, the other thing he also does is he sets up some backups as well, which is he has to do, you know, outside of the context of the snap system because he's backing up data that snaps are managing. So there's an interesting story there. And also, I, I wrote a similar blog post of about a year ago, uh, setting up Ubuntu Core and Nextcloud on the Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, using much of the same techniques he did. But what's interesting is we both achieved the same outcome, but we've gone about some things in different ways. So it mm. also just goes to show there's no sort of like... Um, one right way. One, one, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And also the fact that he's using an Intel machine. Like a lot of people think of Ubuntu mm. Core and IoT and Raspberry Pi, whereas he's using like any old NUC, which could be a, like a super high-end i7 with loads of RAM and loads of storage. But, you know, any Intel-based machine... Yeah, you know, x86 I think smart. machine. I think that's nice. smart using a NUC for you know yeah. file serving. You know, it, the, it's nice and small. You know, yep. mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm seriously. I after I saw that, I'm seriously thinking of nuking one of my uh, micro servers and doing the same thing with the root root disk with that. But I'll think about that. Mm. Mark, what's he also next? has. Oh, sorry, gone. He also has possibly the least pronounceable uh, domain name I've ever seen. Oh, I didn't notice that. <laughs> Links he uses, in the show notes. Yes. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, What's next So, one? yeah, next up, uh, trust and security in the Snap Store. So those uh, eagle-eyed among you might have noticed that over, uh, was it last weekend, mm -hmm. um, there was uh, an app or two pulled from the Snap Store because uh, while they were running, they also ran a cryptocurrency miner on your device. Mm. Um, so and. That, this was naughty. That link that, that we put in the show notes is a link to an article that was written by uh, one of the architects of the Snap system and talking about, you know, the challenges of running a store and the challenges of having um, people upload stuff which isn't reviewed by developers. Yeah. Like, we don't look at every line of code of stuff that goes in the store and the model that the store uses for where where you place your trust and so on. It's, it's quite mm -hmm. an interesting read. Yes, because you don't. There's not a permission for, um, you know, is allowed allow to use this more app than to run a Bitcoin miner, is there? Or yeah. allow it to use more than fifty percent of my CPU or something like that. Yeah, that, exactly. It's, that's certainly something that would be interesting. You know, flag up when applications are using a lot yeah. of CPU. But then there are a lot of applications that could trigger that. You know, yeah. like I'm sure there are people shouting into their podcast <laughs> player Electron right now. Um, and so <clears throat> sometimes those things are masked. And and this yes. was nefarious, you know. It, it, after the um, after the apps were pulled from the store, the, the the person who uploaded them actually posted on OMG Ubuntu. You can go and find the comment in in one of Joey's articles where he talks about, oh, I was just doing this to, to make a little bit of money uh, on the side to support development. But that's counteracted by the fact that none of the apps were his. They were all somebody else's games oh, and I software see. that right. he was repackaging. And he'd gone out of his way to rename the cryptocurrency thing an executable called System D. So if you were running top, <laughs> if you ran top on your system and you saw System D is 100%, you might think, well, that's normal. It sounds like somebody did some great analysis on the, on the contents of these snaps. Who would have that been? <laughs> yeah, I did kind of rip it apart a little bit. Um, so... <laughs> It, it, it was what I found interesting about this was the way in which we reacted. Like as soon as we heard about this, like everything lit up, Telegram lit up, IRC lit up internally, and all our teams were like, "Okay, phone the security team now, get that thing removed from the store." And there was a very brief discussion: what should we do? Remove it now, so no new no new users will be affected by it. Nobody nobody else could install that. But this was on the weekend when, you know, I'm standing in the middle of a football field watching Sam play football. Martin's in the middle of a forest with his family. But obviously we have people on call for this kind of thing. So we phone up those people and do what's necessary to protect the situation and, you know, remove it from the store. And then after that, 
take a deeper look at what exactly the application was doing. But yeah, it was it was fascinating to me, like on the inside, seeing all these people who were super concerned, all internal people on their weekend, jumping on this and, you know, taking care of the problem. And it's not even their job. Like these are people all around the company doing what they can to help you know, minimize the risk for more users. Uh, yeah, that was that. Uh, go and read the post. It's quite interesting. Uh, next up, uh, Will Cook has posted on the Ubuntu Community Hub about uh, wanting to put something called GS Connect in the next release of Ubuntu 18.10, which, by the way, is Cosmic what? Cosmic Cuttlefish. See, Cannibal, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well done. Um, Will's post is talking about potentially adding GS Connect. Um, which is a GNOME shell implementation of KDE Connect, which is the thing Ooh. that talks to your phone and can show your SMS stuff as a notification on your desktop and lots of other integration points between your Android device and your desktop. And this sounds like a super idea. Yes, about time too, really. Hmm. Yeah, it's a great idea. So uh, if you want to help, then we've got a link in the uh, in the show notes that takes you to the community hub to that thread. Get yes, stuck I in. guess it doesn't work with Unity. If it's a GNOME shell extension. I'd imagine not. Right. No, it is specifically a GNOME shell extension. And if you're running uh, a Unity, for example, or Mate or XFCE, then there's um, another project called KDE Connect Indicator, yeah. which will do the same thing for those right. those mm. uh, desktop environments. I've used KDE Connect under, under Unity. I yeah. know some people hate the whole idea and it's an abomination on the world to put kde applications on a non-kde desktop but yeah screw those mm. people i don't care to be fair to be fair <laughs> they've actually done a, a good deal of work to minimize the number of kde framework components that mm. kde connect indicator requires now so you don't like get that sort of flood of kde libraries into the system when you install it these days mm -hmm. good uh finally martin uh what's the last bit of community news well, we've got two more bits as it happens, but okay. the next bit is um, uh, Ubuntu Budgie posted on the Ubuntu release mailing list to request that they have the 32-bit uh, ISOs removed as a release architecture. And following that, a few of the other flavors jumped in and said, we would like to do the same too. So as a result, Ubuntu Budgie, Ubuntu Mate, Ubuntu Studio, and Ubuntu Chillin have all... Uh, requested that the i386 architecture be dropped from their 18.0.10 releases mm. onwards. Is any left? Are there any other flavours that are still doing... Is Ubuntu and Lubuntu and Kubuntu have yet to... I, I don't know the status. I know that mm. they're they're all Haven't discussing things yet. and, you know, their councils are, are going to discuss the pros and cons of this. So we will find out in the fullness of time what their plans are. And, and you were talking there about these flavours all discussing it. There's something yes. else worth talking about there. Yeah, so um, one of the uh, Zubuntu team members suggested that you know there was sort of ad hoc relationships between different people in the various flavors, but there was no sort of central place where we could um, collaborate and work together. So um, we fixed that, and we've now got an IRC channel. Um, it's Ubuntu Dash Flavors on Freenode, uh, spelt the American way. Uh, and all of the flavor leads are in there for the various Ubuntu flavors. And we're discussing ways in which we can better collaborate and work together. And we're uh, working towards having a flavors round table where we periodically get together and sort of, you know, discuss what each of the flavors are up to and uh, where the collaboration points might That's be. That's awesome. You'd yeah, kind of really good. expected that to have been there like 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> but yeah, it's, I, it's I think we've got by on this sort of, you know... <clears throat> Ad hoc, you already. know, we, we you find out somebody's doing something the same or similar, and you just sort of you know get on and do things. But mm. I, I much I much prefer this, mm. and it was really good fun joining that channel and then seeing all of these people join, and it was it was really good. It's nice. Awesome. Uh, we're a bit low on time. We've only got one event left. Mark, what's that event? Uh, Frostcon, which is happening on the twenty fifth and twenty sixth of August, twenty eighteen, at the University of Applied Sciences Bonn Rhein Sieg in Germany. And it looks like a sort of um, uh, og campy type um, get together with a bunch of geeks in a university and talk about cool stuff for a weekend kind of event. Cool. And they're doing a call for papers. Awesome. Thank you for that. And that's the end of the community news and event. We can never have too much feedback. 
Reading your feedback means that we have to come up with less content. So if you're a Redditor, you can comment on our shows through our subreddit, slash r slash Ubuntu podcast. It's always nice hearing Laura's voice again. (laughs) It's the only time I hear her voice is when we do those things. Oh, dear. Oh, man. So this episode is a little bit late because of reasons, but it'll go out and everyone gets to listen to it and we'll not say any more about that, I think. (laughs) Probably best. Yeah. Just gloss over that. All right. So next week we'll um, have some type of love, see your feedback. (laughs) And, Discuss, uh, discussing the end of days aren't we and the end of times yes oh been a while since we've done that yeah thought it was about time see you next time bye bye